Hey, what's good, everybody? It's me, your hero, Benjamin Banks, and you are watching Leveling Up with Benjamin Banks. Joining me as always are my co-hosts from the Leveling Up with Benjamin Banks podcast, Rebellious D, and Double OT, Terrific Trav. How you guys doing today? I almost forgot to get the water ready. Oh, uh, man, I forgot my water. water. I left the jug in the car. Oh, my God. Jugs. Uh, look at them. I know. Yeah, as I'm, usual, man, ready to roll. Ready to roll. I am always ready to roll, too, man. And we have a legend in the game joining us today. Like, you guys... Like, he is a part of our childhood. He's been on shows like mm -hmm. Famous Jet Jackson, X-Men, Sailor Moon, one of my favorite animes of all time. And, uh, you know, that is voice actor, actor, author, stage theater, everything. It's so many. Like, the list goes on of the accomplishments mm -hmm. that this man has done. And that is Mr. Robert Boxdale. Robert, how are you doing today? Well, after that introduction, I'm doing so much better. You wouldn't believe it. Man. I feel <laughs> terrific now. We, we can hey, see it. That, Hey, that's what I do here. Like, that's why I'm the number one hero. Trav's the number two hero. And D, he's just here with us. And yeah, that's, that's right. I'm just here. Just I'm the just, third guy. Just the third guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we really appreciate you joining us. And, you know, before we get into this interview today, too, or before we start getting this train rolling, I want to give a special shout out to Corza Moon, who reached out to us on Twitter. Thank you so much, Corza, for reaching out and setting up this thing with uh, Mr. Boxdale for us, because if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be doing this interview. So thank you so much. And uh, D... I say this first, make sure that you like this video, you subscribe to the channel, you hit that bell button so that way you're always notified when we have new content here on Leveling Up with Benjamin Banks. And D, take it away. As always, other episodes of the podcast found in the description. Like, follow, subscribe to the channel. Thank you all for watching or listening or both. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and Trav, your tip of the day. Hey, man, you know, keep pushing forward. It don't matter where you're from. Even if you're from a small place like Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, dreams come true and you can make it happen hey i like that that's well a good done. trip that's right that's a good tip so let's go ahead and get into this interview so robert one of the first things that we always ask all of our guests up here on leveling up with benjamin banks is what is your origin story every hero or villain has one so tell everybody who you are my origin story uh well i'm a uh i'm a kid from winnipeg manitoba canada um and a flatlander, uh, and uh, my family moved away from Winnipeg when I was about nine or ten years old. We moved overseas to uh, Tanzania and the capital city of Dar es Salaam, and I ended up going to uh, an international school there. Uh, it was run by the Brits, but um, there were people from all over the world going to this school, and so I went to school with people from uh, all four corners of the globe, uh, and uh, one of the things that I, I ended up uh, doing was I was able to, after a while, being exposed to so many different languages and accents and all of this kind of stuff. I used to play around with, with mimicking them, you know, not in a bad way, but right. just learning how, you know, that guy from Scandinavia, he talks in a really interesting way. I wonder if I could do that. Um, and I started doing that kind of a lot. Uh, sometimes for the amusement of my friends, um, but mainly just for my own kind of amusement. I don't know, uh, but that stuck with me uh, right up until, you know, like the very beginning of my professional career. But I was a really quiet kid. Uh, when we moved back to Canada again, I was really quiet, uh, kept to myself a lot. I had like a few tight friends, you know. Right. Um, but that was about it. I hung out with a lot of the geeks. Um, that was my, you know, that's the way I rolled. <laughs> hey, uh, and that's how we and, roll uh, too. That's uh, right. You know, this is my people. <laughs> um, but uh, somehow along the way, I, I was, uh, I used to sing. I really enjoyed singing. And somebody heard me singing. Um, I, I was tapped to do a, a high school musical. Uh, it was called Music Man. And uh, we got up through rehearsals up to, you know, like, I don't know what they call it, uh, like a dress rehearsal. Uh, mm -hmm. And w w it was announced in the middle of the rehearsal that the show was canceled because nobody had managed to secure the rights. Right. Uh, and the school was really, really, you know, stringent on this kind of thing. So we were stuck. We had, you know, I, I, I got a bit bitten by the theater bug 
and I was kind of excited about having, you know, about to do this. And so uh, a, a few of the cast members and I decided we're going to mount our own play. So we did. We mounted uh, Stephen Vincent Benet's uh, The Devil and Daniel Webster. This is a one act play. Uh, and I played the devil. My first in a series, a whole lifetime playing bad guys. Um, and it just, it was just so much more fun to play the yeah. devil than the good guy, you know, I hear you. and, uh, you know, I had, I had some, you know, everybody pitched in, we didn't know what we were doing, but we put the play on, uh, and, uh, and, and enough people liked it that I felt as though this might be something that I'd like to pursue. Um, and sure enough, long story short, cut to the chase, uh, 35 years later, I'm still doing it. Um, and I'm, I still get a, an enormous sense of satisfaction out of uh, working the craft um, and the elements, the various diverse elements that I've kind of learned. Um, and I, I mean, I realized early on uh, in my, when I, once I started, you know, getting paid for my work, um, that getting up to that point was a number of years where I was doing it for free, but I was just doing every possible thing I could do. That I had learned a lot, I had all kinds of these weird skills. And once I became a professional, I was able to kind of put them all together in this little, you know, crazy, uh, you know, ball um, that would allow me to make a living. So I used those talents that I had learned as a kid with the vocal work, you know, learning all of these accents from all of those other people. Um, early days, you know, you would have people doing one person playing multiple characters, all different accents, all different ethnicities. Now they do different kind of casting. But at that time, you know, if, if you could do, if you could sound like this character, you yeah. could get the job. Um, and also I was doing theater. I started doing television, I started doing film, um, and I started writing. Uh, so that kind of for a working actor putting together a patchwork kind of quilt like that or a, a puzzle that's how i refer to it as every one of these types of skills is a piece of that puzzle in order to cobble together a decent living um because you know there's so few people who are in that upper earning income i mean they're almost invisible there's so few we see them all the time we hear about them all the time but uh, there's really only a handful, but there are tens of thousands of working actors um, who actually managed to make a living. And I was one of those, right? So that kind of, that's kind of where I am. Now I'm doing a lot less theater. I'm doing a lot less film and television, I'm a lot pickier about what I do. Of course, the pandemic slowed things down for this industry in a huge way. So I do a little bit of teaching now, uh, online mostly, um, and uh, and I write. So that's my that's kind of my my journey there. Hey, that was an awesome hey, origin. Yeah, mm -hmm. we love yeah. that. And, and you know, a lot of time when we get guests up here, like sometimes the origin story is short. Sometimes it's a really long one, and we really mm -hmm. like the long ones, and we appreciate it because really? you know it's just like your journey from where you started at and. You gave us a lot to piggyback off of and ask you oh, questions good. Not oh, good. And, uh, what you were talking about. And one thing that I, the first thing I want to piggyback off of, because Trav, he's our theater guy. So I already know that he has a bunch of theater questions that he wants to ask you, but um, awesome. I'm a professional wrestler. And when you had mentioned when you did your first role and you played the devil and you was just like uh, being a bad guy, it was one of your first times doing it and you have fun doing it. Being a wrestler, I love being a bad guy because the reaction that you get from the crowd. I mean, you get a, a good reaction when you're a good guy, too. I'm a good guy in wrestling now, but just being the bad guy and just saying stuff to make people mad and, you know, for them to feel what you're saying and believe what you're saying, that just goes to show you, like, how good you are at uh, getting people to believe what you're saying because you know if nobody believes what you're saying because i've seen guys who have been villains in wrestling and it's just like nobody believes them being a bad guy they don't even think that they're a tough guy but when you can right. go out there and you can piss somebody off and then give them their money's worth you're doing a killer job so i agree with you when you said that and um you know something else i wanted to piggyback off of what you said 
Whereas, you know, when you were learning all of these different voices when you were younger and whatnot, that's something that we hear from a lot of voice actors as well. And actors that, you know, you learn these different accents and, you know, from either cartoons that you grew up watching or TV shows or movies from other actors and whatnot. And when you were Mr. Dupree on uh, the famous Jet Jackson, and that show, it took, it, the setting was in the South. And, you know, here you talking down and then here you talking up there with the Southern <laughs> accent, you know? It's, yeah. it's like you're a jack of all trades. And that's a good thing to have in your toolbox is to have all of these things. Because like you said, back then, if you could if you could do the accent, then you got the role. Especially if you, if you were a good actor and you were believable, then you got it. But uh, yeah, those were the two things that I wanted to piggyback off of. And if you wanted to say anything to add to what I just said, the floor is yours. Well, it's interesting, you know, that you say uh, you, you, that you bring up Mr. Dupree because, I mean, he's one of my all-time favorite characters. I, I always I always loved Mr. Dupree. Um, but it, it, being a working uh, a working actor, a work-a-day actor, character actor, uh, having those accents in the back pocket, is it's, it's like absolutely essential. And as a Canadian actor... We have so many American productions that come up to Canada and take advantage of the tax incentives and all of that kind of stuff that we offer. Uh, it can be a great deal uh, cheaper to shoot where we are. And we have all of the same kind of equipment and facilities that there is that exist down in the United States. So um, there are a lot of productions that park themselves up here. So for Canadian actors to actually make a decent living, it behooves them to be able to have a number of regional accents from the United States in their back pocket, right? And I remember going in to read for uh, the famous Jet Jackson, and I kind of really didn't have much of an idea of what the show was, right? Because Disney is a little notorious for being, they're kind of closed mouthed about things, yeah. right? So. Yeah. It was, okay, you know, we just want you to come in and read. And it was in this weird, empty warehouse. I was looking around. It was on the second floor. There were all these, like, abandoned desks. And, and it was weird. I, it was. It really felt like it. And, and somebody was, like, way over there. And over here. And, and, and I went over there. And it was just like this, you know, fluorescent light. And this one guy behind this upturned desk. And I thought, what the hell? I, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah. I just wanted to say that does sound like a hard move. Like over here, and then you go and then you see them scurry off another way. It's like, all right, where are you going? <laughs> what's that movie? Uh, what's yeah, the movie oh. with Jack Nicholson? I mean, I can't think of it right now. And, uh, oh, The Shining. The Shining. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, man. I knew I was going for an audition. I didn't think anyone was going to kill me. So, <laughs> yeah, but, <good. laughs> they, I just had like a, 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 a one page of, of, of text. There was no indication of what they wanted me to do with it, right? Or, or who this character was beyond a school teacher. That's all it said. Yeah, it didn't say where the show took place. It didn't say who this guy was. It didn't say anything like that. Wow. So, uh, Disney was, you know, they're they're really circumspect. They they don't hand out the full script. They don't tell you anything. So, I made this kind of rash decision um, that they 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 said something. Oh, yeah, the guy I was auditioning for said, can you do any kind of, you know, Carolina sort of accent, north, south, mid, I don't know what, Louisiana. And I'm like, oh, I can try something. And I had a hard candy in my pocket. And I popped that in my mouth. And I felt that what it did was it, it gave me a little, some kind of little sound back there that I could kind of, I could hold on to, I don't know, way back. And I had this candy in my mouth. And that was Dupree right there. Was, Dupree was born with that candy in his mouth. Um, and I just said the lines with that candy sitting there. And they went, that's it. That's it. Um, and I got the job before I got home. Um, they'd signed the contracts. And I went off to do this show that I had no idea what it was. That was the coolest show too. You know, we had yeah, all these great show. Shows. Yeah. Oh, it was great, huge, great uh, guest star. Huge following, and and I'm sorry to cut you off, but no, 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 know, no, it's good. There is a lot of fans out there that have been asking Disney, why isn't the famous Jet Jackson on Disney Plus yet? Like the movie was amazing, the TV show was amazing, 
and mm. it just sucks. I mean, we hear this about, uh, you know, because we interviewed Bo Billingsley and he was on a show called Just Jordan that came on Nickelodeon and that show, it's not available anywhere. And it's just wild that you have these TV shows that came out years ago and you right. can't watch them anywhere. They're not even on DVD. You can't find them. Anywhere. I just, I just wonder, I just wonder because a lot of the guest stars may have signed some kind of interesting deals with Disney that may have been time sensitive because I mean, I remember, uh, I went, I went to shoot one day and, and I was in the trailer and somebody said, Oh, destiny's child is, is here as the guest right. star for the thing. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm old enough to go, who? I didn't know who they were. <laughs> really. I, I mean, I, yeah. I was a married man. I had kids. I'm like, what the hell did I know about young singers? I didn't know anything about, Yeah, you know, I was, I was listening to Bob Dylan. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so I, I, and I get summoned to this trailer saying, so, you know, somebody, they want to rehearse with you. And I'm like, sure, cool. And it was this young lady named Beyonce who was, you know, she said, let's run lines. I'm like, yeah, cool. She was the uh, young lady, very, very pleasant person. And we had our scene together and it was excellent. And it's only in, in now looking back going, well, that was kind of a, a really, really cool moment right, right, that right. one can look back on and, sure. and because I've followed her, her, her the tra trajectory of her career for since yeah. then. Um, and it's just been, you know, incredible, uh, and, and wonderful, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know what kind of deals people like that had, uh, you know, for their guest star and stuff. That makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, who knows? I never even thought about it like that. Yeah. Because it's just like, well, if we're going to air this on this on Disney plus, then we have to pay this person. That's exactly this amount what it of money. is. Yeah. So yeah, that, that makes sense. Man. And I will let you know, just because of what you said, the beehive, they definitely will appreciate that when they watch this video, because the beehive, oh, beehive. it's like, they love Beyonce. And if you say anything <laughs> negative about Beyonce, they will come for it. Yeah, uh -huh. they're gonna be like, like, okay, yeah, he worked with Beyonce back in the day. All right, we're gonna kiss me right here. Oh, he kiss me right, right here. Oh, <laughs> pretty awesome story. Looking, watch out, Jay Z. Right, yeah, watch out, Jay Z. We're coming, <laughs> yeah. But uh, but Trav, I'll go ahead and pass the ball to you for the next question. If you're no, not just, ready, Trav, you can Corico to me, you know, no, right no, here no, behind no, me. And you know, I Good? stay ready, I know I stay it. ready. I wouldn't say all that. Go ahead. Uh, going into the uh, kind of the theater stuff, um, like what, how do I want to word this? What exactly brought you into doing some of these production stuff when it comes to you're doing the stuff on television, but still having that love for theater? Because a lot of people, once they hit that transition, to, uh, I'm on television, unless something entices them to come back. They don't really do so. So, is it just out of love and passion? Uh, you know, it's it, it that's it's very true what you just said. Uh, partly because you know, once you start, once you get a taste of the, the kind of money that they pay on, right. on uh -huh. film and television, it, it it can be very difficult fiscally to kind of go back to the theater. Getting getting uh, making a living in the theater can be very challenging. Um, you can get to a certain level where you are, you know, in demand on a certain right. circuit, but you're always on the road, right? I think I spent, there was one period of my career where I spent six years on the road. I didn't have an apartment. I didn't have anything. I just said, oh, wow. wow. And it was just one theater after another theater. And that, that's just trying to make a living. You know right, what I mean? Right. I didn't have a house. I didn't have a car. I, I was just, just trying to get by. So it's pretty hard unless you get into some of those big theaters and I was doing the big regional theaters, you know, 900 seat theater, but we don't have like a Broadway here. We don't have a star system in Canada. Mm -hmm. So you're always kind of, kind of unknown except within the industry. So, you know, once I started doing film and television, I really did stay with it for a long time. I had injured myself uh, on stage at the Royal Manitoba theater center and I really severely hurt my back. And I didn't go back to the theater kind of consistently for a long time while that back injury was still kind of uh, an issue. Uh, and that was 10 years. Um, and then after that, I was making really good money. I started doing all these series. I, I did about six or seven television series 
uh, as, a, as a regular, semi-regular or elite. And so that kind of money and that kind of busyness, you know, when I was doing Jet Jackson, I was also doing another series called Our Hero. So I was going back and forth between sets. And then when Jet Jackson ended, I was still doing Our Hero and I started doing another series called Wind at My Back. And I was going back and forth between sets. And, and that went on for years. And I was doing movies in between. So I didn't really have time to dedicate to theater for a number of years. Um, but when the opportunity did present itself, I went back and I did a one-man show. Um, that was the most challenging theater of all. It was like mind-blowingly difficult, but, but you know, rewarding at the same time. Yeah, Does that I answer your question? Yeah, no, definitely because I've se I can't remember the name of this this uh, individual, but they do a one man show, and it's it's somewhat pop. I mean, it's very popular, especially for a one man show, because that's a hard sell. You ha it's like being a stand up comedian to get to that level where you're the draw is very difficult. So doing those one man shows, what about you is interesting enough to get people to pay that kind of money to come see you do everything on your own, you know? And, and 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 certainly one of the one of the things that can do that is the topic, right? It can right. be the material itself. They may not care who's who's doing the performing. It doesn't matter if they're a star or not. The, the the fact is, a lot of people were coming to see the show I was doing because it was about it was about uh, assisted dying. It was about you know legislation that was being changed around the world uh, for people who were asking for death. And it was, I wasn't, you know, for or against it. I was just, you know, talking about the issues that were going on, uh, especially in Canada, because that's where I did the show. Um, and a lot of people were very interested in that. Certainly, it was generally an older audience, but it was also an audience made of children who had recently lost their parents or a parent who had wanted a procedure done and hadn't been able to get one. Right. So it was fraught with a lot of emotion. So really, and we had discussion periods afterwards, right? So it was kind of political theater in a way. And, uh, you know, we had, we had great, great audiences. I mean, we could have just kept touring the damn thing. Uh, so there's that, right? They don't come necessarily to see the celebrity who's doing the show. <laughs> Not that I was, uh, but, but they came to see the material, right? Right. Um, and also, you know, uh, there are extraordinary playwrights out there who have written shows for one person. Right. Um, and so often uh, audiences will be drawn because this is a, you know, this is a playwright who wrote, you know, they have an enormous track record. Mm -hmm. And so they want to come and hear those words. Okay. See? Yeah. All right. Okay, Robert. So first, before I uh, ask my question, uh, I want to give a shout out to a show that you were a part of that my mom used to watch, which was Forever Night. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I don't I vaguely remember it. And, you know, we were looking through your stuff earlier and. Uh, yeah, I just I saw that and I was like, wow, that's amazing. I mean, it's just it's cool getting to interview the people that we do because you don't know what they were a part of. And uh, I'm not sure if these guys even know what that show is, but I just vaguely remember it. So kudos to you on that one. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of uh, the Creatures of the Night stuff. So um, that's awesome. But my question to you is, yes, sir. what what is your favorite aspect of it? You've seen the industry inside and out, whether it's voice acting, acting, writing, you know, uh, theater. Which part would you say is your your favorite part of it through your journey? Well, that's a really good question, and I, I can I, I'll, I'll start by saying my least favorite part is auditioning, <laughs> okay. and I think that's pretty much universal. Yeah, <laughs> um, and it's interesting, you know, because uh, the largely it doesn't matter who you are or how long you've been in the business, mo most people still have to continue to audition until right. the day they die. Um, because the people who are producing and directing, they need to see the person in front of them reading those words to be able to imagine them actually playing the part. Uh, unless it's a, a deal-driven, you know, like star-driven uh, project. Hmm. My favorite element, uh, you know, I have honestly say is I, I loved doing series work. 
I loved it to be able to explore a character, to be able to play a character consistently over a number of seasons on his long journey, a long story arc, where the increments of character development are often very small and you can play them very subtly, right? And the, the payoff is, is often way down the road. Yeah. And you don't even know it's coming because the writers don't even know what's going to be happening at the end of next season, right? So they're yeah. just doing the best they can to kind of, you know, keep this journey going. Sometimes if you're lucky, uh, I did one series here in Canada called North of 60, which was, you know, Canada's top. It was a number one show for a number of years. And uh, it, the, the, the trajectory of the character was laid out for me at the beginning of each season when I, I went to the writer's room. And they said, this is kind of where you're going to be going. We haven't written all the episodes yet, but we have a kind of a storyline that's going to be, that's your arc. It's going to be going through that. And that was fantastic. I loved, that. I loved going to work, you know, every day with a lot of the same people and working out bits, you know, um, consistency, learn, learning other people's styles, working on your own um, and getting a regular paycheck. All those things wrapped together, <laughs> couldn't beat it. Yeah. I mean, you're also building, I mean, obviously chemistry is in there somewhere too. Absolutely. And then you just, yeah, I mean, I, I can I definitely know. understand that. And that's a phenomenal answer yourself, sir. Thanks. <laughs> Back to you. Hey, thank you, kind sir. So, yeah. uh, Robert, you know, I want to get to the nitty gritty and I got to <laughs> bring up Sailor Moon. <laughs> you know, Sailor Moon, <laughs> it was one of my favorite animes that I enjoyed watching in my childhood when it used to come on Toonami. Along with Dragon Ball Z, Roman Warriors. I was about to say, one of the only Kajun ones. Wing. That's all we had. <laughs> and that's all I had. For real, I mean, like, that is all we had. But, yeah. you know, just working on that series as uh, Prince Diamond, you know, and, and this was the original, the Deke dub, because, like, there have been so many dubs that have come out over the years. You know, what was it, you know, preparing and going into this role? Like, when, like, did you even know what Sailor Moon was when no. you auditioned uh -huh. for this? No. Doubt it. No, I have no idea. You know, uh, I played I played three characters. Uh, there was Zirconia, Tanawatakari. I can't remember his name. I can't pronounce his name right now because I, I got it written down somewhere. But um, and uh, and Prince Diamond, which was a larger thing. You know, I, I really didn't know anything. I, I I suppose in the back of my mind, I had you know heard of Sailor Moon. But again, I was a grown man. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a family. Yeah. And as far as I knew, it was like, you know, Hello Kitty. It's for little girls, you know? That's what I, was in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. You know, at, that, at that time, that's, yeah. th that's, yeah. what, that's what Sailor Moon was. It was no, in no, another, for sure. It was in another language. It was, I, I had seen it yeah. when I, you know, visited nieces or whatever. So You didn't have a lot to go off of either. Yeah. And nothing to go on. So I'm, I'm, uh, my, I was living out of, out of Toronto at that time, way out of Toronto, like three hours north of Toronto. And, and, and Toronto's a big city, man. It's like a huge city. It's really hard to get out of. Uh, and the traffic's so bad. And I would stay in Toronto all week, and then I would, I would drive home uh, on the weekends. And, and Friday night, the traffic was just awful. It was early days of cell phones. You know, yeah. like I had a I had a big brick phone, antenna. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, I remember. Yeah, the ones. <laughs> yeah. suitcase uh, reception suitcase. anywhere, man. No, this one was no, it wasn't a suitcase, yes. but but close. Uh, <laughs> it was a weapon for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, so and and I kept it on my lap when I was driving my jeep going up north, and uh, I, I, you know I'd been a whole week in town. Mm -hmm. And it's like afternoon, rush hour, really difficult traffic getting out of the city. I finally get out of the city and my phone rings and it's my agent. And she says, uh, can you come back into the city for an audition? I'm like, oh, <laughs> no, I no, just I, joked. no, I haven't seen my wife and my son all week. And I, you know, yeah. I'm out of the city. I'm out, you know, I could be home. Still. Well, you know, it's, she said, okay, well, can you do, uh, they want to know if you can sound like Yoda. And I said, well, sure, who can't sound like Yoda? <laughs> uh, and, and so she said, can you do your Yoda for me? And I, I did, you know, a quick little Yoda. And she went, okay, turn around, go back into the city and, and, and do this audition. 
God. So I did. I fought my way all the way back in. And I, and I, I get into this little studio and uh, there's a woman there who she's from Montreal and her English wasn't very good. She spoke French. My French is pretty good. Um, but so we had an interesting kind of time communicating with each other where she and she's we we're just in this little booth you know and there was nobody else there and she was in the engineering room and she said okay uh i want to hear your yoda i'm like, oh, okay sure um so i gave her you know just a little thing um and she said okay well i'm gonna i'm gonna project a couple of lines up on the screen and uh there's gonna be a uh what do they used to call it the rhythmo band so there would be the, the text goes across the screen with a slash and you had to you had to hit that and there were all these mouth sounds written down there right all these little weird sounds that the characters would make and you had to match that by reading these little cryptographs mm -hmm. uh, plus you had to match the mouth movements of the character because right, yeah. they were all yeah. in time now the reason she ran that uh, and had me do it that way is because about 50% of uh, actors can't work the rhythm of man. Right, yeah. They actually can't do it. Yeah. Because yeah. They're, they're trying to look at the mouth. They're trying to look at the words. They're trying to look at the timing. And there's all, all these different characters are coming in at all these different levels. Uh, and they come in at different times. You have to follow your track. Sometimes it's here and sometimes mm -hmm. it's up there and sometimes. So it, it really is a... a, a it's tricky as hell. It really is tricky. No, it sounds like that's a lot going yeah. on. Yeah. There's a lot going on. It sounds on. like rock band or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I've never done like, it. Like doing karaoke words. and having yeah. to follow. Yeah. Like five different people all coming in at different times Oof. and making noises and, and, you know, doing all this stuff and watching the characters. Because sometimes they fall and you have to do impact noises. Yeah. Now, Robert, quick question that since we're, you brought us here and you're you're telling us a little a little about the ins and outs of the bit. So when you say it's on a meter, it's like like a high pitched scream it could be, and then as it goes down, is it like is it a depth of voice that you're looking at? No, what you're seeing is you're seeing all of these individual lines that are drawn across yeah. the video screen, mm -hmm. and then each one of them is crawling the text for each different character that may be appearing on the screen. Oh, okay. So you're oh, reading your man. lines. So your lines Got come it. in here at one point, and then there's a band that comes across, and it cuts there. And as soon as it hits there, each word, each letter, it, your your sentence is going across Got that it. band. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's very complicated. Anyway, yeah, she, found, she could see right then that I could do it, because I had done that kind of work before. And that's what she was testing me on. So, you know, we worked on the Yoda a little bit, and then she was happy with that. Because everybody can do yoga. Yoga. Yeah. Sure. So, what she wanted to hear then was my own voice. Kind of a relaxed, seductive, up close to the microphone. The Prince Diamond kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I gave her that. And she went, okay, that, thanks, bye. <laughs> so I turned around and, and I started driving back through the freaking traffic again. Yeah. Um, all, and, and I got almost to the same point uh, out of town. Oh, no. This is like, it took me about an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> and I'm sweating. There's no air conditioning in my Jeep. Uh, and the phone rings. I almost threw it out the window. <laughs> Did you take a deep breath when it rang? <laughs> Yeah, well, I was like, oh, God, no, they want me back for something. They want me back. They want me to, 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 to change it a little bit or something. Because they yeah. often do that, right? Come back and do it slightly different. And I answered the phone, and, and it was my agent saying, you've got the job. They've hired you. Nice. And they, they don't want you to just play the one character. They want you to play three. Wow. Uh, make it worth awesome. your while. So yeah, it was nice. awesome. I was yeah. really pleased about that. And uh, so, you know, my phone paid for itself. Yeah. Uh -huh. in, yeah. in those days, not everybody had one of those things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, but the rest of the, sh the, the recording, and I, you know, I don't know if you're interested in this or not, but the rest of the oh, recording yeah. sessions. Yeah. Were, yeah. Or is yours? What do they call it? Uh, Sailor Moon. <laughs> the rest <laughs> of the sessions. Hello, Kitty. I, yeah. 
I didn't even I didn't even meet up with any of the other actors. All right. They, were, they recorded on. all of our lines separately. So I'd go into the booth. I'd, I'd be called in for you know like eleven in the morning or something. I'd get there. I might meet an actor who was coming out. Who was right. going up the other way? They just finished their session. But I don't really remember that. I, I, I remember meeting one actor. There was one actor that I met uh, who had played my partner in Robocop. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, Susan Roman is her name. She's one of the main characters on Sailor Moon. You guys might know her. Um, and she's one of the sailors. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, okay. More kittens. <laughs> 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 and uh, so anyway, uh, that's it. I, otherwise, I was alone in the booth and right, doing right. my voices, listening to other people's voices in my head. And that was it, you know, uh, and it was a long time ago. So now let me ask you this, because, you know, with the convention scene being as popular as it is, and one of the cool things that we love about going to cons is meeting voice actors. I mean, we interview voice actors and actors up here, which is cool. But when you actually get to meet you know, your favorite voice actor from an anime or cartoon that you watched growing up. Have you been invited to any cons? And if you have, do you have any interesting con stories from fans over here? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I, I've only started. I have to say that I was unaware of these cons mm -hmm. until recently. It was like just before the pandemic, there was a, a, a fanatic con. This, you know, small convention that started up in Ottawa, the capital yeah. city of here. And uh, I, I, this guy reached out to me and uh, and he said, oh, you know, we're big fans. And I was like, of what? What can you be? <laughs> what? How old are you? You know, he's like, oh, you know, I used to watch you on Teddy Ruxpin when I was a little kid. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man, really? Okay, good. That's great. So uh, he said, no, I'd really like you to come to this and, and we're going to give you a table and you can sit there. I said, well, what am I going to do? Just sit there? Nobody's going to recognize me. I mean, I, I was a character. I was a cartoon character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, so he said, no, no, we'll, we'll design a poster for you and all this kind of stuff. Banner. And, yep. A banner. banner. Yep. A, a banner with all this. So I've got this really nice banner with all these characters on it. And nice. So... I did my first one and uh, I was scheduled to do a few more and then the pandemic hit and that shut down all those plans. And I just finished doing one up in a town called Deep River, which is his new con. Um, what was it called? The Geek Fest. Geek Fest. The Geek, Geek Fest. Fest. And Sounds I thought like these are my people. Oh, Geek Fest. Geek. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you said Deek Fest, where it's just Deek all Fest. these Deek the voice Deek actors. Voice actors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this guy. I was the only, uh, uh, you know, kind of anime cartoon character guy who was there. Right. I was their celebrity guy. And it was absolutely lovely. It really was. Um, you know, we were we, we started off at about 10 o'clock in the morning in this, you know, arena. They had it all decked out. It was really nice. They treated me beautifully. They gave me an assistant and everything. And uh, at about 2 o'clock, the power went up in the entire city. Oh, no. Just, uh -oh. A tuxedo mask probably showed up. Oh, was that rose sticking out of the table when the lights came back? I, I I had twinkly lights all over my table. Well, you see, I was selling my book. I was selling my book, right? So I had all I had a whole section with just my book and all these lights and everything. But I was also, you know, glad hunting and signing some little picture stuff. And it was really nice. The people were great. Uh, and I I know I'd love to do more of these things. If I'm invited, I will go. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hey, well, we know some people. We got. I knew. I Virginia. knew it was coming, D. You already I knew hey, it look, was coming. Hey, but you know, uh, you Prin know. Princess Jasmine, she's a huge Sailor Moon Sailor fan. fan. Yeah. You know yeah, what I'm that's saying? Very so, true. And it's just like we rub elbows. And she's partial to the Deke dub. Ah, yep. yeah. She that's loves. She grew the up on. So. Yeah. So, hey, we just got to put in the word, and she'll fly you out here, and then we'll have oh. a, a, a basket of breadsticks for you because that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but, uh, but, but uh tribe go ahead i was gonna say answer. wait you, you beat me to the punch a little bit sh showing off the book but a, a tie-in yeah. you know because i definitely want to talk about your book now willow's run yeah. and then your next book coming out but go for it. um i want to tie into that a little bit because when banks first told me about you coming on 
you know, I was like, man, that was one of my favorite episodes of Jet Jackson when you got arrested for showing them the Fahrenheit book and you know they they arrested you they took you downtown and all the students were right. you know uh was that picketing you know trying to get you back yeah, and, you know, protest. And yeah. all, and all was, these years later mr dupree got his own book oh, you know? <laughs> i'll show that you was called saving mr dupree uh, mm -hmm. saving mr. Uh, dupree. got your own episode and everything and it won an award i believe it it was right around the time of Saving Private Ryan, so they named it Saving mm -hmm. Mr. Dupree. Yeah, okay. no, it, that was a good one. It had something to say. I, I really liked right. that. Yeah. And it's still going on today. You know, the band list of books that have come out this year or last year or something, uh, there's a lot of outrage over these books that are being banned. And, you know, that's a whole separate mm. case of things. But I definitely want to talk about Willow's Run and... You know, if you kind of want to plug that a little bit and tell us what inspired you to write this story. Well, it's interesting. You know, I, I, when I, I started pulling back from show business a little bit because I started getting a little uh, cynical about it all. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and I, I, I had told myself when I started out that uh, the day I stopped looking forward to going into work is the day I stopped. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I, there was, there was too much, uh, there was too much lying going on. Right. And, and it was kind of serial lying. It was going all the way up to the top, all the way up to the top, and all the way from the top to the bottom. And, and I didn't get it. I don't know why. I didn't understand why people were just not telling the truth or they, they, were, they were trying to pull one over on you all the time or, or something. I don't know what was going on, but I, I didn't like it. And uh, so I, I started pulling away. And as, as I was getting older, losing my hair and whatnot, uh, I, it was getting more and more difficult to get roles, and I thought, well, why, why am I fighting so hard? I gotta just, I gotta just step, step back. I'm not happy, and I did. We were living out in the country, and I looked around for something else to do, and I did a bunch of other things while I was up there, you know, to keep myself occupied, to, you know, express myself artistically, make a little money. But uh, one of the things I did was I started working at this local library. I was doing barcoding. It was a part-time job. It was quiet. I enjoyed the. I loved being in the library, and I loved it so much that I started working there more and more and more. And I told the librarian, I, "I'd love to, you know, take some shifts here, help out." It was a rural library; it wasn't busy. She said, "You know, we have a program where we will put you through uh, this fast-track library school, and at no cost to you." because it's part of the grant program that we have and, and we need more librarians where we are. And I said, okay. So I went back to school uh, when I was 49 and um, I got my diploma in library. So I became a library manager. Eventually I had my own branch. I was a branch wow. librarian. Nice. It was a small little rural branch, but it was mine. And I redesigned it and all this stuff. And while I was working there, I was so immersed and surrounded by books. I've always been a big reader, uh, always, especially when I was in the theater. You know, two, three books a week was normal for me. Because uh, you do have a lot of downtime, right, when you're right. performing at night. So uh, I, I just love books. So here I was and looking around all these books, and I thought, I've got some time. I'm going to... I'm going to, I think I'm going to write something. Now, I've always written a little bit, you know, I wrote, I wrote for a TV series for a little bit. I created a television series. I was in development for a couple of years for a television series I created. And so I, the, the idea of writing didn't really scare me, but I thought it would be a great challenge to write a book. And I wanted to write a book that I would want to read. See what I'm saying? So, uh, I read all about writing a book, right? Writing a novel. Uh, and then I took a year off. I had this little cabin overlooking the lake because we lived way out in the country on a private lake. And I had this little cabin and I tricked it out so that I had a desk and a bed and no electricity. I didn't use, I, I wrote the whole thing by candlelight by hand on paper. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no technology at all. And I decided I was going to write a thousand words a day until I was finished, until the story ended. And I did for months and months and months. Even on the day of my father's funeral, I wrote a thousand words. I was that dedicated, you know, you know, a, a little bit, 
as dedicated as Benjamin is uh, with, with his working out. Um, I, I, I had to do that thousand words every day. I couldn't take a day off. Um, and it was a huge book by the time I'd finished it. It was massive. Um, but that was the beginning of uh, this book that is now called Willow's Run, uh, that is much smaller. It, it, I mean, it still is 452 pages. I would say I've cut 452 pages from it. Mm. It was probably 900 pages when I, you know, um, it's gone through 19 drafts. And, uh, you know, when I thought it was finished, I brought in an editor and he said, no, no, you're not finished. Um, and then I brought in another editor after that, and proofreaders and all of this kind of stuff. So it's gone through the whole, mm -hmm. the whole thing. And I've learned a lot um, about the process of, of, of writing, creating a book. And I have an enormous amount of respect for people who actually make a living doing this. Oh, yeah, you know? yeah, it's no yeah. joke. That is oh, I mean, just I mean, uh, pretty much what the story is about, you know, a woman on the run from her sadistic husband. And like she's in a RV just trying to escape. And you hear these stories about, you know, women who are in abusive relationships and, you know, they finally just like, I've had enough. And like now they're trying to get away. And, you know, she's going through this adventure of her own and, you know, finding herself and everything. And, you know, I, I feel like that that's a really interesting story. And then it's a story that people need to read about or watch because, you know, people, they go through so much stuff. And when you can have something that is relatable, you know, it's just like, well, yeah, I went through something like this and, you know, I got away from it. And to, yes. you know, read this story, man, like, you know, how would you feel if your book got turned into a television show? Well, you know, I'd feel okay. I, as, as a lot of us know, you, you know, the, the television shows or movies, they never really live up to the, the, the complexities that are presented in any book. Yeah, um, because they just can't address all of those kind of details, right? Um, and and if it's a series, they they often you know just kind of drag it out because they got to make more money, so yeah. they just keep dragging it out, dragging it out, creating, putting new characters. But uh, you know, uh, this thing here was written visually because I'm a visual guy because of the, the work that I've been doing. So a lot of people who've read it have have sent me back that response saying this this book literally played like a movie in my head mm. because it is very very visual i don't spend a lot of time inside the characters heads you know it's not a literary novel mm -hmm. it is it's very much it's action things are going on uh the plot moves forward every single chapter is basically a cliffhanger there's characters that are very clearly drawn. They're people that we can imagine immediately when we when we you know come across them in the book, um, and they're unexpected. You know, the main character she's six foot six, uh, and she's a you know she's an ex volleyball player, ex you know Olympic volleyball player, who you know, her husband got her hooked on drugs, painkillers, and she was at a fog for years and she finally comes out of this fog through some kind of accident where she doesn't take her medication and stuff and she realizes what the heck's been going on in her life and that's what that's when she escapes right and the rest of it is all her she's taking control of herself and her life despite all of these things that's that keep happening to her uh, even though she's offered help by these people in a small town, she starts discovering really dark stuff and she deals with it head on, uh, which is, you know, it's her character growth, right? It's her forward motion as a human. Um, and a lot of the, you know, the, the people that she deals with, they all have their own issues that they are dealing with that we all can understand. You know, there's yeah. there's pain, there's grief, there's all of these touchstones. Like you said, you no, know, this is a this is something that we recognize. So everyone has these things in here that we recognize. Well, maybe there's one character that maybe not so much. <laughs> he, he has some bad habits, that, and maybe we don't know about. <laughs> so let everybody know where they can find Willow's Run at. 
All right. This book, Willow's Run. Got, if you hey, here's my big plug. If you want to find this book, you can ask uh, Mr. or Mrs. Google. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. you just have to type this in here. You may be my name if you want to. But you type in <laughs> Willow's Run, and it's going to come up. It's going to come up on a whole variety of platforms. Okay, it's worldwide on almost every platform you can possibly find. I am not selling this in bookstores because bookstores insist that they have to be able to return it if it is not sold at your expense. So mm -hmm. I would have to pay to ship it to them and to ship it away and often to destroy it. Right. And it would cost four times what the book is worth. So I'm, I'm not going that route. But it's yeah. everywhere, man, and it's in every format. It's in hardcover. It's in large print hardcover. It's in audiobook. I've narrated the audiobook myself, and I'm told nice. it's very good. I had a great time doing it. Um, and it's in uh, soft cover, and it's an ebook, uh, which is cheap. It's like you know, four and a half bucks. Right. Uh, you know, so Amazon. It's easy to find on Amazon. Really easy to find. Nice. Okay. Nice. There you go. Hey, nice plug. Well, well said. Why, nice well plug. Said. And y'all go out and y'all buy the book. You can buy it wherever. You know what I'm saying? That's uh, right. I was going to ask, <laughs> is, the, is she carry the C a sequel, or is this a whole separate story altogether? Very good question. It is not a sequel, although I've been asked about this by most of the people who read it. Like the last couple of hundred messages I've gotten back from this is, you know, oh, when are you going to write the next book about this character? <laughs> and I said, well, not right now, because I've already written another book, and it has nothing to do with her. Uh, yeah. She Carried the Sea, is, is it, it takes place in a different kind of mindset, in a different part of the world. It's got a different tone to it. Very, very, very short chapters. And, and it's about unresolved grief in this young woman. Um, it's a it's a crazy little story it's based on something that I heard about that actually happened. This young woman meets this guy. She falls in love with him. And, well, she breaks off with this other guy first. But she falls in love with this guy. They decide to go on this crazy little trip. They end up in Nova Scotia, Canada. This beautiful little beach. And they're walking along the beach just having a picnic. It's the middle of the day. It's a gorgeous day. He's about 50 feet in front of her. He turns around to her and waves. And a wave comes out and takes him into the ocean. And she never sees him again. Wow. Mm. That's the beginning of the book. That and it's sound. based on a true story. Right. But wow. it kind of becomes a bit of a ghost story after that. She, she buys this house overlooking the sea and she renovates it and stuff. And things start to happen. Mm -hmm. I like that. But like I say, it's, it's written very differently. It's a very different tone. Um, so that's, I'm in my second draft right now. I'm out in Prince Edward Island, Canada. Where I'm way out on the East coast, uh, on a, you know, in a little cabin right now, uh, overlooking the sea. And, uh, I've been poking away at the second draft right now. Yeah. That's awesome. Hell yeah. Yeah. So inspiration you know, I, at its finest. I know. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like when you had mentioned like a ghost story, that's a good segue because we're here at the end of the interview. And, uh, you know, D, he always has his famous questions that he loves to ask all of our guests at the end of every interview. So, D, the floor is yours, brother. Thank you, Captain. All right. So, first question for you, Mr. Robert, is favorite 80s or 90s movie or both if you have one of each? Yes. Uh, Princess Bride. Mm. Nice choice. The easy one. Yeah, good choice. All right. You got me. Yeah. All right. And That's it? Uh, no, second question. Oh, okay, this one, good. This one might give you a little bit more. Okay, so growing up, was there anything that spooked you, scared you, and stayed with you? Whether it was a creepy lullaby, something that you saw that just kind of stuck with you, um, a movie, you know, villain, character, creepy doll. What was it? One thing that scared me the most as a kid that stuck with me was uh, there was a terrible old fashioned little cartoon called, uh, uh, I don't know if it was Frosty the Snowman or it was, it was about this kid who goes up to the North Pole 
and there's an abominable snowman up there. He's got these little teeth, and it was just like puppets and stuff. Mm. But when that thing came out of this ice cave for the first time, I must have seen it. I must have been six years old. Are you talking was, about the? I'm sorry. Are you talking about like claymation? Footage? Yeah, the yeah, claymation. claymation shows? Yeah. I'm not sure if it was claymation. It might. That's have been. what I was thinking too. Back I, was gonna say, that is I don't think. I don't think goes. he's talking about year without a Santa Claus. No, no, no. This would have been 1965. Oh no, that's probably. And, probably yeah, there. Atkinson Film Arts, I think, made it. Um, and uh, it was hmm. something frosty. So, I don't know what it was. It was a you know, it was an amalgamation of a few stories, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, but there was this this snow this abominable snow this, this kind of weird looking ice creature with these yeah. little fangs and these red eyes and I was oh, scared right. of that thing I was so scared I was petrified <laughs> and I remember that feeling in my chest like right now I can remember yeah. uh, as being like m worse than somebody pulling a gun on it was yeah. just I was locked I couldn't do anything. So yeah, that's the most scared I've ever been. That's the thing. Wow. That was my boogeyman. The Yeti. Yeah, that's a pretty the Yeti yeah, will get you. Yeti, yeah, it will. Yeah. You the Yeti. Feel that yeah. cold behind you. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> phenomenal answers. Uh, you know, as usual, how how we do here on leveling up with Benjamin Banks. Back to you, Banks. And so, hey, look, like I said, we're here at the end of the interview. So, Robert, thank you so much for joining us up here on Leveling Up with Benjamin Banks. You are an amazing guest. Yeah. And uh, before we let you go, let everybody in social media land know where they can find you at. Oh, they can find me at uh, robertboxstall.com. Uh, weird spelling for my last name. It's A-E-L, Boxstall. Same way you spell Michael, A-E-L. Oh, I love it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Love it. So, robertboxstall.com. <laughs> you can find me there. Uh, and uh, otherwise, listen, uh, fellas, it's been a real treat uh, to be here. Uh, it, it's great Absolutely. to meet you guys. It's good to and, meet uh, you, too. Great oh, questions. Yeah. you got a great atmosphere going on here, and uh, I, I really appreciate your, uh, your, your your generosity of spirit, and uh, and, I, and and thank you all. Hey, man, oh, you're a legend, you. so thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. You. Yeah. And, uh, before we let you go, because we need one more thing for you before we wrap this thing up, but... Uh, Trav, so that way we can go ahead and uh, get to the end. Let everybody in social media land know where they can find you at. That's right. You can find me on the Instagram at ZK Audio. I'm on the uh, Twitter at T R A V I O S C K, where I'm also on Letterbox, ranking and rating my movie watches. And if they're looking for a rebellious Deke, where are they going to find him at? <laughs> you can find me as always at rebellious double underscore D23 Instagram.com. And thanks. As always, if they need a hero, if there's an abominable snowman coming to get them, <laughs> where can they find a hero to deal with? Hey, you can find me, your hero, Benjamin Banks, at King Benji underscore Banks on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me on Facebook at Benjamin Banks. I should be the first person to pop up. If not, then I need to contact Mr. Zuckerberg. Thank you all again, everybody, for watching this interview. Please make sure that you go and you follow Robert on Everything that he has, support him. Yep. Buy Willow's Run. Support this man. He is awesome. He is a legend. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you follow all our social media accounts. Make sure you check out the other interviews, reaction videos, and reviews that we have here on the channel. Our podcast with brand new episodes that come out every Tuesday. The link is down below in the description. Then the video of that interview is up here on YouTube on Friday. So with that being said, keep that pinky up. Stay positive. We'll see you next time on Leveling Up with Benjamin Banks. Peace. Thanks again, everybody, for watching another episode of Leveling Up with Benjamin Banks. Make sure you like, follow, subscribe to the channel. Podcast, we got that too. Make sure you give us a thumbs up and hit that bell for further episodes and notifications. Thanks a lot to our patrons. And if you don't mind, join the Patreon. We'll be having new specials coming up soon.